Okay, so th today, this morning, I'm at Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, and it is a place that you can get to from New York City with public transportation. But the reason I'm really making this video today is so that I have students who do ecological projects, and I'll give you ideas by showing you certain things, but I'm not going to give you questions. So you may think, well, nature preserve, you really can't get there. But I'm even going to show you some things that you can see almost anywhere, like in the middle of the city. So if you take a look, you see sidewalk, and you see what you may consider weeds on the sidewalk. They're only weeds because we don't want them, right? That's understandable. But especially in the middle of the sidewalk. But really, it's a question of succession. And this is a secondary succession, if you think about it, because those seeds have been in the area, sometimes underneath. Um, there are seeds in the seed bank underneath a, uh, either a parking lot, a driveway, a sidewalk. And sometimes the seeds do blow into the cracks and get started there. But it is something, um, there's something called parking lot ecology. And this may give you some questions. That's just one thought. Also, take a look at the grass. This is not natural. That grass is like a lawn. If you have some of this, and then you have a boundary that's really clearly delineated between this and the natural world there, that's mowed. It's, you have to think about the land usage and how things got into certain places. For example, these trees are not planted, but later on I'll talk about the idea of understanding if those trees are planted or not and the influence that this may have on your experiment. A couple things about this place. One, it does have some forested area and this is not, and the cross the street actually from where we are with the West Pond is more forested and more of a typical forest. Um, you can think about the idea of what trails might do as well and, and what you could study around them. Um, I'm here early in the morning in early, early September and you do need to be aware of what time of day it is, how this might influence animals or plants by the way, and what time of year it is. And right now it's not technically fall from, you know, talking about astronomy but for certain animals, it's been fall. They, birds are migrating through and have been, some of them, have been migrating through since late July. So please do be aware of that if you're conducting any study. Okay, so if you're going to study anything here or any other place really, you should look into who, whose permission you need. Um, so here you do need to talk to the rangers and if you're one of my students you should ask me and I can talk to them as well And that might make a bit of a difference um, One thing that when you're doing a study that you may want to consider if you're looking for a question How do abiotic factors? You know, so non-living things, right? Or biotic factors influence what you find So here we're dealing, like I said, it is forested in spots it is also on salt water, so you're dealing with a salt marsh, and I'll show you a couple pictures of that in a second. And um, that does make a huge difference. So these are just things to consider. Also, can you conduct your study? If your study is to count every single piece of vegetation on the side of this trail, maybe your methods are wrong. Maybe that's not a good study. Maybe it's the question, but probably in this case, the methods. You want to think about census versus taking a sample and how to do that and keep it either random or uniform. It's really depends on what you're looking to do. If you take a look out there, you do see in the foreground, you see Phragmites, which is an invasive species. And in the background, you see some natural native grass. So, um, actually, the, the, in the foreground, that Phragmites might or might not be native. It depends. It, it actually appears to be small enough that it could be our native type of Phragmites, but a lot of it isn't, and that gets to be problematic. But it's another thing for you to research and think about. 
Um, but again, this does have an extensive salt marsh component to it. And actually in the middle, on the other side of the trail, there's a pool. So I will show you that as well. You can see some prickly pear cactus. I mean, there's a lot here. What you do want to avoid is making comparisons that don't make any sense. So if you are choosing a study question, you wouldn't want to compare this area to downtown um, Manhattan or Brooklyn. It just doesn't make any sense in, from the standpoint that there are other variables here that you're right on the water, for example. And, and that's a big one. So you really want to think about what compares well and, and how you can isolate that one variable that, that you're really interested in and only that. So choosing this as either, well, choosing this as a comparison may be problematic depending on what you want to compare it to. Comparing two sites within this same area might make more sense to you. Depends what your question is. Okay, so you can look at my shadow as we go along and walk and talk because um, no one really needs to see my face anyway. Let's talk. So if I'm planning a study, one thing I could look at would be community structure. And community structure really entails a lot of things, but it's mostly based upon down to one level species, right? So you could talk about the different species that exist in an area and the abundance of each. And that, that's a component of community structure. And you can do that with plants, you can do that with animals, you can do that with whatever, by the way. Uh, plants usually lead to, for the most part, the three-dimensional structure of an environment, right? So that's also a component of your community structure. So think about what is really going on, and you can hear Carolina Wren calling for you, um, what is really going on in the environment is based upon plants, which is based upon soil, and you can use that as part of your experiments too. But if you want to look at community structure, you can measure plants, you can think about height, you can think about the, that part of the three-dimensional nature. But if you want to make those comparisons between species assemblages, including abundance, one tool that you can use is to use indices. So there's Shannon's, which is more accepted than, Sim than the Simpsons. You could use either. And you could look at evenness. And these are just tools to analyze a question that you come up with. Just like any species you look at or any type of organism that you look at. Maybe I want to study birds. That's not really how science usually works, although you can do it this time. Um, it's not how science usually works in that we usually pick out, and here's the pool in the middle. We usually pick out species depending if they can help with our hypothesis, with the question that we're asking. The question is more important than the species chosen. Species chosen is usually the way to assay my hypothesis, and that's what it really is about. So again, you could look into those indices. You can do that with insects and trees in the city. Just have a good question. It doesn't have to be an area like this at all. It could be right outside a restaurant. Um, there's there are always living things around. So um, we'll get more into that again later as well. So your experiment has to also have a real purpose to it. If you see the white dots back there, they're all swans, they're all mute swans. But you're not constructing a study just because you want to count mute swans. There has to be a real rationale, a, a real purpose that means something. So a lot of times what scientists will do is they'll think within the context of current problems and, and areas of study. You know, we could always think about global climate change. Now you don't have time in the school experiment that we're going to be doing to do more than a snapshot. And that's why we can't do real manipulative experiments, experiments sometimes in ecology either because they take too long. Trees take a long time to grow, for example. 
but there are ways to take snapshots and comparisons and to be able to get some data from that. But th we really, you could look at things like the effects of the pandemic upon certain groups of wildlife and, and whatnot. That's a possibility too. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but that's not a fleshed out question. The one thing you absolutely need to do is see what's been done already. Do the research. Even if you talk to me, if you're one of my students and you talk to me and I tell you, that sounds like a good idea. First thing you need to do is even before approaching me or after approaching me, either way, go and see what other people have done. Make sure you're not repeating something because your experiment to be a real experiment needs to be novel. It needs to be new. One of the problems that we have historically in ecology is that we look for pristine, we look for pure, and we try to get examples of that. And you might think that this is pure and pristine. It is absolutely not, mind you. Um, what is pure and pristine? I mean, we have all sorts of chemicals up the, the Arctic Circle. So everywhere, we're, we're globally, we've influenced this planet anyway. So one of the things that we need more research into, that we've avoided through the years, that we're starting to pick up a little bit more on now, is urban ecology. And, and I'm not even just talking about a place like this, which is obviously in New York City's boundaries, but not really what you would consider urban. It doesn't look like a city. And to a good degree, it has different properties than you would in downtown Manhattan, for example. Therefore, please, Think about if, if you are doing research in the city itself, there are valid, valuable questions that need to be asked that we do not know the answers to. Do not shy away from that just because I'm showing you mostly Jamaica Bay on this video and um, it's an easy place for me to get to, but it might not be easy for you to get to. So again, cracks in the sidewalk, trees, even trees in parks like Central Park or wherever might be planted specifically in those locations. So looking at that for dispersal or for being something natural, that might not be true anyway. And when you do, um, just take that into account. Take into account that it may not be something that originated naturally. It may be something planted, no matter where you are, even here. Um, there are some trees that are planted here. I know exactly where they are. So that is a concern as you're trying to figure out what's really going on. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later. Something else you really need to consider when you're doing these types of studies, or most studies I would assume, would be scale. Time scale, obviously you're, if you're doing this for this course, um, then your time is limited by that. Or spatial scale, are you counting something really small? Or are you instead looking at landscape scale and using satellite imagery or something like that. Now that you, you, is something that is, is very valuable and you can do. Or you can look at something really, 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 really small using a magnifying glass and look at that type of scale. That dictates your, your question should dictate that. And that can dictate your methodology. Okay, so we are still in a nature preserve so you may think all of this is natural and a lot of the greenery on the uh, the underlayer um, understory are naturally dispersed but a lot of those smaller trees actually were planted I, I, saw, I saw them planted I know they were um, you would not be able to figure that out necessarily just by looking at them they're native plants that were chosen by um, this wildlife refuge and a little bit of a restoration project here in this spot. So do be aware, again, land use and, and being able to tell and being able to know the history of the land and who planted what and if it is completely natural does make a difference in your experiment.
So what is a good way to tell if an area like this is indeed natural entirely in terms of how these plants got here and dispersion patterns of seeds and, and whatnot. Um, well, one way in this case was to check their website. So do a little work to find out the history of the land. Um, that's always important. And, and then um, again, some of it will be guesswork because unfortunately, if you're talking about seed dispersal and then seed predation and things like that, um, we, we can guess, but we don't know if all of that is unaffected by the activities of man before you got there 20 years in the past or something like that. Um, but you should try and give your best effort to find out. So I thought I'd show you what the other side looks like. It's a lot less sandy when it comes to the soil. A um, lot more like what you consider a true forest, although that's a distinction I'm not going to really make. Um, just want to talk about a couple of other potential thought processes that you can employ as you look around your environment, whether your environment has these birch trees on the side or not. Um, that's of little consequence, really. So many questions you could ask. So if you do have trees in a more city type landscape, single trees, even if they're planted, what effects might that have on, I don't know, we can think about insects, we can think about how wind and light posts and things like that may influence the organisms that live in that area as well. And it could be any type of organism that you're really looking at. Um, and especially, like I said, if you're in that type of environment, it's that human interaction dynamic that I would concentrate on and explore. But there are other possibilities. There are also, you know, think about smart cities and making cities greener and, and green belts and wildlife corridors which exist in cities. And you can find things even if they don't exist next to you. You can find things that kind of simulate them in ways. Um, and think about that for city planning and urban planning and there are some practical components of that as well to explore so think about all of that and more many questions out there last thing I want to discuss and yes this is a spotting scope I'm carrying um, when you design an experiment the planning is essential I mean, every detail needs to be spelled out in advance, not, not as you go along, not adjust on the fly. That is not acceptable in most circumstances, almost all. There are exceptions to that. I mean, sometimes things happen. However, you should have a backup plan and a plan A, B, C, and D, thinking about potential problems like that. The other thing you need to plan out, which for new people making experiments, for, for students, for example, you need to plan out in advance your statistical analysis. That has to be done before the experiment. What are you going to do? What are you going to employ? You can and must do that in advance. That is part of your planning. So I think with that, any further questions? For those of you who have me in class, Talk to me then.